etc. Um, we, the, uh, for the, none of y'all that read the textbook, some of the, the stuff that we talked about in class Tuesday comes out of chapter one and chapter two from the textbook that I'm using is open sex, open resources, same thing. Uh, and the, the rest of what we're getting to is coming out of chapter three of that book. Um, I don't know why I just told you all that. But um, there is, it's probably, if it hasn't shown up for you already, it is going to be showing up sometime today, probably. I can't remember. I think I, I put it up there and I said it to automatically trigger a homework problem set for chapter three, just for practice. We're probably not going to get far enough along for you to do it today. My leftover people from 201 probably, I mean, y'all can do it. Um, but it's just a little bit of practice and messing with this kind of stuff. But if you see it, look at it. And if you're like, what? Then, okay, then we didn't get that far and just put a pin on it over the weekend. Really, really, really bored, and you're sitting home because of the freezing rain and snow or whatever. So, a couple other random things is maximizing. What does it mean to maximize? Yeah, get it as big as you can. You've got the in your computer. You've got the little minimize window and maximize window, and the whatever the X. I mean, the window buttons up here to talk. Right. What happens when you hit the maximize button? You see. The entire screen, right? There's no screen real estate not getting used. So, generally, as consumers, we try to maximize stuff and keep the most out of it. That's our utility, joy, happiness, satisfaction, whatever. In our time here, given our limited resources, most bang for our buck, we want to get as happy as we can. So, we're not going to spend our money on things that don't make us happy, and through things we can spend it on that make us happy. We're not going to do things we don't want to do unless we have to do it, right? And the reason we have to do it is because if we don't do it, it's something horrible is going to happen, like we die or whatever. You know, we eat spinach not because we want to, but because we have to, right? Because we don't want to get scurvy and all that, whatever. But well, we have all chapter coming up soon about utility. But we're trying to get the most happiness that we can. If you see a pack of peanut M and M's and a pack of regular M and M's, which one are you going to buy? You only got the money to buy one. Okay, why? Because that's your favorite, right? If you see peanut M&Ms and peanut butter Reese's Pieces, what? which are you going to buy? Absolutely peanut M&Ms. Reese's Pieces have peanut butter and that's the Right. So, we're going to get this. What? Peanut butter is not good. Peanuts is good. No, what's the opposite? How can something that is derived from the same thing not be good? If you're eating peanuts, you're one step away from eating peanut butter. Yeah, but it's the whole butter part of it. And I like butter. But just because two, two, just two good things, you mix them together, they don't work. Beer and chocolate doesn't work. Uh, this thing, it don't work. Uh, well, then you make chocolate beer, so there's that. Yeah, and it just, no, it just doesn't work. Um... Just anyway, I'm not going to. Anyway, these things don't go together. Just um. Just, anyway, don't have to talk. But we're trying to get the most enjoyment out of our time here. How really? Okay, so uh, businesses are trying to get the most of what? Profit. Profit. Why? Who started businesses? Humans. Consumers are us as humans. And why do people start businesses? To get more money, that's the profit, after the expenses that go back into the owner's pocket so they can do what? Get to sell more happiness. Why am I going to start my own business and make my life worse than it would be if I just went to work somewhere else? No, I make more money. Yeah. Hopefully, you know, you know, I'll take the risk because I'll make more money. We a little bit were hinting about this, I don't know if you remember in one of the ag classes yesterday talking about farmers, and when the dust settles, a lot of farmers, they ain't making much profit and they're barely making wages and they probably would have a lot less stress and more money if they quit their running their own business and they went to work at Burger King. It's kind of depressing, but there you go. But that's the number one reason why people start their own businesses 
profit and they want to get the most profit they can out of it because they want to get the most happiness that they can more money in their pockets so they can have nicer houses, nicer, nicer cars, and higher earlier. And if you don't think that you can do that, then you go and work for somebody else. So the government is our third person. What is the government here to make the most of? Taxes. No. It seems like they're trying to get the most tax money out of it. No. Confusion? Maybe, but no, that's not why. Why, why did we... You know, a couple hundred years ago, middle fingers in the air to Britain and say, we don't want this government on our shoulders. And then what did we do? We turned right around and formed our own government. That was taxes. Well, the, that well, taxes is government. why we got rid of them, but taxes is not why we went ahead and started our own government right after we kicked them out. Representation. Regulations. Why? Yeah. Re okay, some regulations. Okay, for you. I don't, okay, then maybe my question is slightly flawed here. Yeah. But why do we have government in the first place? Because we need some rules, we need some boundaries, we need some stuff. And there's things that we can't do on our own, so we need to cooperate in order to do it. Because we don't have enough time in the day to teach our kids, to build our own highways, to fix our own nuclear missiles, to keep people from invading our yard, to sit on our front porch with a shotgun and make sure somebody's not going to come in and steal our stuff. And also go out there and grow our own food and that kind of thing. So what really... What is the role of government in our society? Infrastructure. Infrastructure, that's part of it. Who said that? Um, infrastructure is part of it. What else did y'all say? Safety. Safety, that's part of it. What are they doing? They are providing services for the general well being. I really need to change the words welfare to well being. Either way. Well-being of society. It ain't welfare. Like, you know, they're there to get the most welfare checks into the pockets. But no, that's why I want to replace the word well-being with word. Replace welfare with well-being. The government makes rules for society. The government does stuff for society. They provide services like highways and education systems, that kind of stuff, for society. But they know that sometimes when they do things, it's going to help some people and it's going to hurt some people. And so they've got to sort of do the balance. How many people are going to get the benefits from us doing this? How many people are going to get hurt from doing this? And it's a little bit by degrees. If a bunch of people get just a really bitty really bit of benefit, but then a few people really get screwed over, well, maybe we shouldn't do that. But if a few people are going to get minor inconvenience and a whole bunch of people are going to benefit, well, let's pass that rule. And they've got to strike that balance. And that's what the government is really, truly about. Why do this speed limit 55 miles an hour? keeping me from driving as fast as I want to. Well, they're like, well, they want to slow us down a little bit because what happens if things go sideways and we're doing 80 miles an hour on a back road somewhere? So people are going to get killed, right? So if you limit people to doing 45 or 35 on a back road or something like that, instead of people getting killed, there's going to be people get injured, right? They strike the balance of that. So any spending cuts, tax cuts, any spending decisions, are we going to build another school, build another highway, are we going to build a border wall between us and Canada, all of those, uh, any of those decisions, it's all based on what are the costs, what are the benefits, and overall the government is there to benefit us. Who is the government? Us. Us. We the people, right? First three words of the Constitution. No, 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 that's probably it's in the Declaration. We the people of the United States yeah. set forth upon this continent of the United No, 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 that's the Gettysburg Address. The World Four World Perfect Union is the Constitution. Yeah, yes, so it's it's the Constitution. yes, okay. It, so it is the Constitution. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Um, Brandon Romans, how do you mean you hear your. Come to Barry Caesar, that was crazy. What? Why do you put the beginning of the Gettysburg Address? I obviously didn't because I, because that's for scored seven years ago today. Oh, wow. our forefathers set forth upon this constitution. That's what I'm like. That's what I'm like. That's the history. Yeah, across the streams. So, ghosts survive. How many have you seen Ghostbusters? Okay, the real one, the original one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. just making sure. Okay, so. So, I sort of have hinted at this for the last slide. Why do people interact? Economic interactions. Why do we do business with one another? Why are we not just sitting there with middle fingers 
point it out to anybody that walks by and you're sitting there in front porch and shotgun. Because we can't do it all ourselves. We don't have time to teach our kids and plant our own crops and tend to our livestock and make sure nobody's going to break into our house and make sure that nobody's going to invade our country and make our own clothes and all of that stuff and build our own highway. We can't do it all ourselves. So how many of you can teach your own kids physics? Okay. Okay. Just so. Uh, so it's like if, if your kids are going to learn physics, they ain't learning anything. All right. So what do we do? If most of us aren't smart enough to teach anybody physics, so what do we do? We all pull together a little bit of money and we find somebody who is smart enough to teach physics. We give them some money and let them teach our kids. All right. That's the way, that's what we're doing. I don't know. How many of y'all know how to build a cell phone? You don't. So what do we do? We pull together our money, we pay people, and we buy the cell phones. Anyway. That's what we do. We can't do it all because of limitations. Limited time, limited money, limited knowledge, limited resources, limited energy, limited patience. So we kind of have to do business with one another. So market is where buyers and sellers meet. And I'm introducing the vocabulary here of demanders, for buyers, suppliers for sellers. That way we can get to the supply and demand. And demanders, that's what we are as a buyer. You go into a restaurant and you order food and they say, we don't have it, you're going to be what? You're going to be a little bit hot. You go home this afternoon, you turn on the TV and nothing but buzz. Or you can say, well, that's nice, Greg, to you taking the day off. Okay, they're celebrating the government shutdown and I guess I will too, I'm going to take a nap. No, you're kind of mad. You, okay, yeah, maybe you didn't pay your bill. <laughs> but if, okay, you got the NFL Sunday ticket and the games buzz out because they don't have enough game, what do you have? Because you want what you want when you want it. Well, you also take the money back already. Yeah, you pay money for it and you want what you pay for. I demand it when I pay. I, I want my soda. I want my direct TV. I want my internet. I'm just trying not to sing the I want my MTV. Don't pay what it is. Anyway, uh, okay, so that's one 1970s and two 1980s decades references already. We're only in the 80s. Okay, uh, but yeah, demand, it might seem a little bit strong of a word, but yeah, that's what we want. You know, we, we go into the Black Friday and we're one of the people waiting in line to, so when they open the door, we can knock over some people and go back and get one of those TVs. And what do you feel when you're not one of the people that have to get it? Man, we want what we want, what we want. Well, sure. But somewhere along the line, supply and demand are going to have to meet because if we, if they ain't buying it, we ain't going to make it. If we ain't make, buy it. If they ain't making it, we ain't buying it. Right. So supply is the ability and willingness of people, businesses, whoever, to produce a product. Bring it to us. It's true, but at different price levels, you a given time period. This stop you can stop at willingness and ability to produce. If watermelons are selling for a dollar a piece, how many of you could drop out of school and go into the watermelon business? If watermelons are selling for a hundred dollars a piece, how many of you could drop out of school and get into the watermelon business? Yeah, no, still no. That's going to create a bubble that eventually is going to burst, and I'm going to be left holding a bunch of watermelons that have to unload at a loss. Is that right? Fair enough. Long view. But, uh, but our ability and willingness to produce is going to be dictated partially on price, and we talk about it in a given time period, which um, David, I was going to say that. Uh, David is taking the long view. Some of y'all are taking the long, short view, around 100 bucks for the next few weeks store. Uh, but it's our ability and willingness to prove. Gee, some of you might be, yeah, I'd love to get into the watermelon business, but I ain't got any land. You don't have the ability to grow watermelons. Right. Some of you are like, I would like to get into the watermelon business, but I'm allergic to watermelons. And if I look at them, my eyes start breaking out, let alone when I start touching them. You don't have the ability to do it. Where some people are like, ew, dirt is icky, worms are icky, worms are icky. Some people are not willing to. Without willingness and ability, it ain't going to get made. And the higher the price, it makes it easier for us to be able to produce. Because you may not have land now, but if you can sell these watermelons for $1,000 a piece, 
You can afford to buy some land, right? You can afford to go to the bank and borrow some money and buy some land in order to go give you pay it off with the first watermelon you sell, right? Unless you live in Venezuela. Unless you live in Venezuela. Why'd you say that? It's another country that's like their inflation is like a thousand percent a day or something like that. Oh, I. Not, I I mean, I oh yeah, I, I, I mean I haven't well, probably given the corrupt nature of the government. I really haven't looked at Venezuela, but I remember trying to buy Brazil in the eighties. But but our willingness and ability to produce. Are you willing to produce it? Are you able to produce it? Where demand is our willingness and ability to buy. Do are we interested in a product? And do we have money? That's going to be the first two on the very next slide. Do we have money? Do we have time? Do we like the flavor of it? Those are the things that are going to determine are we interested in the product. As I kind of already hinted at now, um, I have no demand for peanut butter. Okay. Do I have the ability to buy it? I actually have a couple bucks in my wallet. Woo! I think I have 15. Sure. Um, I've got some money, so I have the ability to get, buy watermelon. watermelon. Peanut butter. Do I have the willingness to buy peanut butter? No. Matthew likes peanut butter. He's willing to buy peanut butter. Matthew has zero dollars in his pocket. So he doesn't have the ability to buy watermelon. All right. But then there's Haley, who she likes peanut butter. She beat somebody up in the hallway earlier today and took her wallet. So I'm thinking she's got enough money that she, she's willing and able to buy peanut butter. So. The demand for product only exists as long as there's a, somebody willing and able to pay it, pay for it. Uh, the example I use in 201 is what eagle lip soup. While I'm going in business, and I'm catching a bunch of eagles, I'm ripping their lips off, and I'm making soup for it. Would any of you try that? Yeah. There's no way of knowing if we haven't already eaten that. Well, yeah, because I dare say eagles do not have lips. So there you go. But if it didn't, okay, how about um, roach intestine soup? No way of knowing if we ever have it. <laughs> yeah. But I'm going to label it this way. I'm going to label it this way and sell it this way. How many of you say, score? And you in a grocery store or you in a fancy restaurant and it's like you know, roach intestine soup? And you're going to go, yeah. No. I just say nobody would buy roach intestine soup. So should I bother? Trying to go into business and mine whatever machines and stuff and stuff that I need in order to make roach intestine soup. I don't know. It's also a lot of roaches. Yes. Yeah. And I, I apologize for any of y'all who I don't know how have roach intestines. I've never gone there mentally before. That I apologize. But, but if nobody's going to be interested, then there's absolutely no point in me making it. But, if, if there's demand that exists, then you have to start examining things. How much demand exists? How many people do I think I can sell it to? How much money do I think I can sell it to them? Can I afford to make people make a living off of it? Is it worth my time? But because we have to bear in mind when people buy something, there's an opportunity cost. What are you giving up? Because you bought my can of eagle lip soup, that's 99 cents less than you have to buy. And a sun drop, and any other yeah, chicken noodle soup, peanut butter soup, what else could you have bought with that 99 cents instead of buying my eagle lip soup? What would it take for y'all to go down to that stack machine back at the end of the hallway, look at that zero bar at the bottom shelf, and actually buy it? Not much, because it's zero bar. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> Most people are like, and just uh, and just people just don't need it if they end up collecting dust. But for a lot of people, uh, I'm not stick my money and get to zero bar because I put that in it. Well, I ain't getting peanut M Ms, I ain't getting Snickers, I ain't getting Milky Way, I ain't getting Three Musketeers. I'm like, I would rather you giving up eating a Three Musketeers in order to eat zero bar because how many of you would be sitting here eating a zero bar and say, you know what would taste great with this? The Three Musketeers. Start two fisting candy bars and bite bite. Okay, maybe you would. <laughs> I think it's a pretty good idea. Okay. Okay. The law of demand, go back to science class, the law is true. Remember, we're assuming rational behavior and people are going to act in a way that makes sense. And what makes sense? When the price drops, we're going to buy 
less Oh, excuse me, yes, I'm illiterate. When price gets lower, and you can, you, when price gets lower, we buy more. When price gets higher, we buy less. Does that make sense to you? Is that logical? And even if you throw logic out, because you've never met a human being in your life, and you are not a human being yourself, congratulations. But here you think about it. If the price is going up, well, it's going to take a bigger chunk of your paycheck, right? So you're going to have less money in your wallet to buy anything else? If all I ever bought was Sundrop and I made $100 a week, you know, I, I bought it, I make $100 a week and Sundrop sell for a dollar a piece, I can buy 100 cans of Sundrop. Well, if the price of Sundrop moves up to a buck fifty, I still, still spend my entire $100 worth of paycheck on Sundrops, but I ain't going home with 100 cans anymore, right? I, it, it, unless I can get a pay raise or I can be like, hey, when you start mugging people in the hallway, that yeah. I cannot buy as much, my paycheck won't go with the car. So, and you can just give it to me like that on the test. Price goes up, we buy more. Price goes, oh, I said that wrong. Price goes up, we buy less. Price goes down, we buy more. You can give me either of those as a definition on the test. I'm not so cranky about the wording as long as I get that you get what we're doing here. This is getting into the, part of the first part of the homework. We can create a demand schedule, which is just a table where I can sit here and I can ask what more product we want to talk about. Let's do something over here with Sundrop, but it's sort of an everyday product. Cloud, flower, toilet paper, everyday product. Yeah. Now, everyday use, for this, but it ain't purchased very often. So let's make something that might get purchased more often. No. Okay, no. No. Uh, by the gallon? Sure. Okay. The gallons are done. So we can sit here and we can start. Okay, here. And a dollar, if you can get milk for a dollar gallon, how many gallons of milk would you go through a week? A few. I'd say five. You would drink five gallons of milk in a week if you could get it for a dollar gallon. Okay, if milk is selling for like three dollars a gallon, so I would just have five dollars milk. You go through in a week or two. Yeah, that's about what I go through in a week. Okay, if milk went up to five dollars a gallon, like it does from time to time, how long would you feel? Maybe four. How much milk would you buy to drink in a week? Maybe more. Maybe one. If milk went up to six, six dollars a gallon, how much would you drink in a week? Yeah, I'd be buying half a gallon. We can. I'm happy. Okay, if it went up to seven dollars a gallon. Okay. So let me actually sort of flip it over a little bit because we're kind of getting here. Um, Carrie, if you could get milk for free, congratulations! You win a lifetime supply of milk. How much would you drink in a week? Probably not that much. Because I'm probably be getting tired of it. Well, I would assume you're gonna drink more than five a week. Well, yeah, but just, yeah. For yes, the first few months. Yeah, let's go with that. Let's start off. Start off. <laughs> That's all I'll drink. So, so let's say uh, seven, one each day. Okay. Seven. Okay. okay. This would be this would be Carrie's demand for milk, and we've done a demand schedule here. And so, okay, and you can sort of well, well let's eyeball it. Let's see, at three dollars, you buy two gallons, and five dollars, you buy one gallon. What would happen if the price was four dollars? Wait, buy, buy one and a half gallons, right? You can start eyeballing it and that kind of thing. That's where the demand schedule is. But we don't just do this for Carrie. We do this for Josie, Loveling, David, Haley, Bobby, and that be Sam, Matthew, Will, okay, Bobby, CB. So we, so we can end up with the demand for the entire classroom. Then I can go down the hallway and I can start talking to people and Dr. Hayes' class and people in the water, whoever's going on in here go to Tiffany's class, and I can end up with a demand for Canvas. I can end up with a demand, talk to people out in the community, get a demand for the greater Alberta area, get a demand for the county, get a demand for the state. Is this good information to have? Yeah. What if instead of milk, we talking candy bars? <coughs> And you started talking about college students, and your job was to be filling these snack machines in the hallway. How important is it? Yeah. 
Yeah. That gives you an idea about what candy bars you need to be putting in there, what price is the best price for you to sell, how often should you be showing up on campus in order to refill that machine, right? And if you sort of like, well, I can't refill the machine, but once a week, well, then you just start doing that. How many candy bars can you put in there at one time, and then find a price that's the highest you can get that will let you sell out all of the candy bars you have. This is pretty good information for businesses to have, so um, so market research gets you this. Take my marketing class next semester, and then there you go. And y'all are laughing about me doing that. Y'all are like, I thought you already were. <laughs> so this is just an example for those of you following along at home. You don't worry about it. Just, but and this is normally what you see: the higher the price goes, the less you worry about it. And we saw that with Karen. Uh, when the price was high, like five, six dollars a gallon, he's drinking one gallon or less a week. But when the price is low, down to five dollars a gallon, I mean a dollar a gallon, he's drinking five of them. If you can even get them for free, he'll go all the way up to seven. Just for one person. Oh, for this example, I don't know. I don't know what this is. This is an example I made up. It could be toothpicks, man. Yeah, it could be toothpicks. Yeah, well, you know. Like Listen, that. baby, I don't know why you buy like 8,000. If you're on a restaurant, you go through a lot of toothpicks. Yeah, um, like that would be good. So, not toothpicks. Toothpicks. You play this in toothpaste. That was like once. Yeah. Um, I mean, that could be like a convenience store selling candy bars or something like that. If you own two stores, 8,000 units goes pretty fast. Yeah. Yeah, but it's selling them at a dollar piece, eight thousand. Okay, but it does. But just if you were to try to sell candy bars at five dollars a piece, people are going somewhere else to buy the candy bars. Oh. So that could be the demand that a gas station was facing for selling candy bars. Or that could actually be the demand for the this tank machine down the hallway. I doubt they're selling five thousand candy bars. But I keep talking about food. So how many of y'all went to the tank machine after class? So a domain curve is we can take this information and we can graph it. A picture is worth a thousand words. Um, and it visually will show you how the changing in the price is going to change the customer behavior. So when you graph somebody's demand, generally domain curves are going to look like this. Theoretically. Going to carry some information. Let's grab this. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. We have a dollar, three dollars, five, six, seven. That's what I went through. Let's see. A uh, dollar. He was drinking five of them. Okay. At a dollar piece, he was drinking five of them. At three dollars a piece, he was drinking. To at five dollars a piece, he was only doing one. At six dollars a piece, he was doing half of one. At three, the price was zero. He was doing seven. So we connect the dots. You get a curve like that. We shocked. We shocked by any of that. Oh, I'm sort of going to. I can't remember. If I, I don't think I actually have you graphing this on homework. I think I took ask you what would the domain curve look like, but I'm not actually making you do the graphing on homework, and I'm not going to make you do the graphing on it. But I want you to understand a few things here. Visually, you can start doing things like eyeballing. Well, uh, a buck and a half for two dollars. How many would you drink? Whatever that is. But there's a couple of interesting points here. What's that? That's the highest. Yeah, in math class, y'all call that a y-intercept, right? Y-intercept is your starting point. In this case, this is how low the price has to get before Carrie starts getting interested in milk. Once it's beyond $7 a gallon, he doesn't care what the price is. He ain't interested. Once it starts dropping down to less than 7 He's starting to get interested. Once it gets to six, he's drinking a half a gallon a week. Well, maybe if it was six fifty, maybe instead of half a gallon a week, maybe he gets a half a gallon a month. 
I go get a pint here, a pint there, maybe he only drinks two pint, two gallons for the entire year, but that still was a little bit of something. But it'll get to the point where the price gets so high, he's like, eh, hey, no more. I'm done with milk. So the starting point, your Y intercept, your plant class, all it is is your starting point. In this case, it's where you see start getting interested in buying milk when the price gets down to less than $7 a gallon. The other weird point is here, is anybody ever going to say free milk for all? No, no business is going to stay in business giving away their products for free. Thanks for it, guys. No, they don't, because they're giving the advertisements. They're making money on back end here. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, Google, same thing. Just, anyway. I, but, but generally speaking, milk, no dairy is going to be going out milking cows and giving away milk for free. So in reality, you're not going to see these uh, the upper end and the lower end, maybe up for an individual basis, but we would have been in craft the demand for just the 12 of y'all in this classroom. We lose those ends. That's why, generally speaking, we ignore the top end and the bottom end of the demand curve because it's really meaningless and no business in the right mind is going to be operating out there. But just know it does exist. What would it take for us to get Carrie to drink more than seven gallons of milk a week? Yeah, yeah the line continues to negative number. The price would have to be negative number. We'd have to start paying him to drink milk. Every gallon you drink, we pay you a dollar. How many gallons were you drinking a week? A lot. A lot. It's more. Yeah, but, it, but it's only a dollar. You just like a little bit. So, yeah. So, is any company going to do that? No. So, so that's why, you know, once you get down to the lower end, it really doesn't make sense, but it does exist. This would be your X intercept that they never talked about in the math class, but it's sort of the same thing. It's a stopping point for your Y intercept. You starting point. What about that surplus we talked about? What surplus we talked about? Well, all the classrooms that notice sometimes that there's a stuff in Oh, yes. Oh, we will be coming to that next Tuesday. We need to do that tomorrow. But, but you visually, this is all the demand curve. And the picture's worth a thousand words. So you can see, visually speaking, even if you don't even look at the numbers, you can see the higher the price. Less is getting bought. Right. The lower the price, the more is getting bought. So it's just worth a thousand words. Go with me. Okay. What makes us want to buy milk? No. What makes us have a demand for milk? What makes us willing and able to buy milk, to buy peanut butter, to buy peanut m to buy sun drop, to buy bullets, to buy chickens? What makes us interested? That's what I'm talking about. What makes us interested in the product? When you walk in a store, what makes you go to that part of the store and start looking around? That's what we're talking about. What determines your demand, what determines your willingness and ability to buy? What's number one? Do you, like it? Do you like the product? If I don't like the price of product, I don't like the taste of Brussels sprouts, I'm not even going to that part of the store. Right? It's not even looking. I'm walking past the shelf. I'm walking past the shelf that has the Britney Spears CDs. Just keep on trucking. Ain't even looking. Right? Just because ain't certainly ain't buying. I'm walking past where they had the MacBooks and that kind of stuff, and the iPhones and some nuts. Walking past them. Do you like it? Do you prefer it? What does the product do for you and is it? Your tastes change over time. That's going to change your willingness and ability to buy. Some of y'all had some of them, whatever. I can't even think of the names of the people that were making music, music 15 years ago. But what's the what's girl, Hannah Montana girl? Did y'all listen to her growing up? Oh, Billy Ray Cyrus' daughter? Yeah, her. Did y'all ever listen to her, whatever her name is? Miley Cyrus? Yeah. Anybody? I'm not a bit true now. I see a couple of heads in this thing. Just, yeah, y'all you know, used to listen to that kind of stuff. And these people were the frozen soundtrack five years ago, but ain't nobody listening to that now. Right? Just, our tastes change. Our preferences change. Because it comes down to me, maybe, you know, you like the taste of chocolate, but the doctor tells you that if you eat chocolate, you're going to die, and we prefer not to eat things that will kill us. Right? 
Some of us haven't even spoken. Okay, we're right along. Sun drops probably by the bed. So, okay, you like the product. You like what the product can do for you. What else makes you willing and able to buy? Money. Do you have any money to buy? And generally, we talk about that income. If you don't have any money, then you ain't buying it. So, you interested in product, and then you have money. You. You pull into the gas station, you're filling up the gas tank, and you're walking in the counter, you're walking in the face of gas. You go over there to the soda aisle. Well, maybe you like soda, but you don't have any money, you don't go over there. You don't like soda, you don't go over there. But if you have money and you like soda and you're thirsty because it's a hot day and a cold beverage with it, you go over there. All right. What else? Price is not on this list. Because this is psychology here. What makes you interested in product? Personally, price has a lot to do with it. No, price determines how much you buy, but not whether you're interested in the first place. Price determines now that you're interested. Yeah, sure. Now that you're in the price, now that you're interested in how much ever you need to buy. But if you ain't interested, you don't have, I don't have a clue what the price of Brussels sprouts is. And I'm not going to be walking in the store one day, hating Brussels sprouts, and say, ooh, buy one of you one for you, load up the cart. Uh, no. It's the price determines how much we end up buying, but this is all about our willingness and ability to buy. If the price gets lower, we're able to buy more than we could when the price is high, but if you don't have any money in the first place, you ain't able to buy in the first place. So. The third item is expectation. What do you think is happening with product? What do you think is happening with you? What do you think is happening with life in general? Do you think you're going to lose your job next week or you're going to be buying more stuff or less stuff this week? Look, if you think an asteroid is about ready to strike the planet and kill everybody, are you going to be buying more stuff or less stuff? Or you're going to die. Why are you buying anything? You're buying so that you can be happy for those last couple of days, right? Just. I mean, I guess. Yes. Um, or you can take your money and set it outside and set it on fire and look at all the people that are trying to do that. But if you think you're going to get a pay raise next week, is that going to affect you buying this week? Yes. No. It shouldn't. A reasonable person it should. Well, it depends. You hear me on power expectation. If you think it's 1% chance you're going to get a pay raise next week, no. If you're 99.9% .9 sure that you're going to get a pay raise next week, you might. You know, you still live, live, hand, live in hand to mouth, hand to mouth, barely scraping by, knowing I'm going to have a big boatload of money next week. Let me go in and put, put some extra groceries on the credit card this week. It would it could change. If you think that you're eyeballing a TV and you think the price of the TV is going to go down next week, or then next week is Black Friday, oh, this is it, you're, you're, you're giving away. If you think the price of the TV is just going to be going up over the next few weeks, what are you going to do? Buy it now. If you think that the iPhone next year is going to be more expensive because of the trade war with China and all that kind of stuff, and that increased cost of aluminum and that kind of stuff, so the next year's iPhone is going to cost eleven hundred dollars instead of a thousand, maybe you would buy that iPhone this year instead of next year. They pretty much figure out that a thousand dollars is not as much as they can charge anymore. Yes, and that's kind of their problem because their costs are going up and their sales are going down, and so that's why they had their first sale or earnings warning. Last week, and their stock plummeted. Yeah, their stock is highly inflated in the first place. Yes, yeah. and that's why they built that. Um, I mean, at a that cheaper model that pretty much does the same thing as the yeah. thousand dollar model. But interesting enough, yeah, but interesting enough, those, yeah, those, those aren't selling. Yeah, the XS or XR, <laughs> whatever. The XR, they're comparing it with the oh, other XR, whatever. Yeah. yeah, it's bizarrely enough not selling, though. It kind of should. The camera isn't quite as good, but otherwise, it's the exact same phone, it is in color. But and several hundred dollars cheaper. That's bizarre. Really yeah. like the yes. a brand not, point clock. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And really, when it does settle, still the best buy for an iPhone is last year's iPhone 10. Anyway, so now, um, to going, which I know I have, I'm sure I have this on the next slide, and I probably just misspelled it there. Price tag. Yes, I did. It's, it's expectations. Price expectations. That's it. The price is not on here, but price expectations isn't. Uh, 
Christ doesn't determine are you interested in. But Christ's expectations is going to impact your decision to buy. If I think it's going to be cheaper next week, I'm going to wait. If I think it's going to be more expensive next week, I'm going to buy it. If I think I'm going to get killed by aliens next week, maybe I'll buy it this week instead. Those expectations are the price will can factor in. So what do you think is going to happen in the future for you, for the economy, for the product itself? This one doesn't really impact us as individuals, but when you look at all 320 million of us, the number of buyers, the more humans there are, the more humans there are on the planet, the more bottles of Coke that Coca-Cola is going to sell. Right. We all drink Coke. Then there is the price of related goods. We have two types, substitutes and complements. You might like, a, I like a Coke a little bit better than I like a Pepsi. But if I see Pepsi's on sale and Coke ain't on sale, I'm gonna buy the Pepsi. If they're the same price, I'm buying the Coke. If there's a couple cents difference, I might still buy the Coke. If it's more than a nickel difference, I'm drinking a Pepsi. That kind of thing happens for you. For substitutes, you, we consider other products. Yeah, you know, I could get the thousand dollar iPhone, or I could get six hundred dollar pick four, six hundred dollar one plus sixteen. Or I could get two hundred dollar Moto G five or G six, whichever one it is. Uh, but we so hopefully we do our shopping, we do our comparison shopping, we do our investigation along the way, and we talk about that in chapter. Either two or three, module two or module three, I can't remember the word. But complements as well, the cost of the things that go together with what you're using. If gasoline gets really expensive, people aren't going to drive as much. So if people aren't going to be driving as much, guess what? We're not going to be buying as much gasoline, right? Well, also, if we're not driving as much, we're not going to be wearing out our tires, so we won't be buying tires as often, too, right? Tires and gasoline are complements for one another. Uh, peanut butter, jelly, and bread are complements for one another because the B, B, and J without the B kind of sucks. So if bread gets pretty darn expensive, we ain't going to buy bread. And if we ain't buying bread, then we're going to be thinking twice about putting a jar of jelly and a jar of peanut butter in our shopping carts. Right? So we kind of consider those things hand in hand. When y'all were deciding how many classes that y'all were signing up for, well, you had a complement that went along with each tuition payment called the price of books. And some people were like, well, based on the price of books, I've got to pay. And that guy said, I'm only taking three classes this month instead of four because I can't afford to do four of them mm -hmm. buying all them expensive books that I got to buy. Unless the class is going off the books. Unless the, the class is going off the books. But there are some people that price of the books ends up dictating how many classes they can end up taking. Those are going to determine, are we interested in the product? Are we willing to buy the product? And as I suggested to you, those de determinants change on a daily basis. You, know. you don't listen to the same music you listened to when you were five. You don't watch the same movies that you were watching when you were five. You aren't watching the same TV show you were watching when you were five. You all don't watch TV anymore, apparently. I just watch YouTube video. Yeah, just well, any TV show that you want is pretty much all on anyway. So yes. Netflix, Hulu, Amazon. Yes. And then y'all don't legally buy music anymore. It's just I don't even have a TV series that I watch. I don't have a Netflix or a Hulu or anything. I steal that too. I steal it. <laughs> you steal that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, actually, I get to I appreciate your I appreciate your honesty and uh, talking about your dishonesty. But yeah. <laughs> I might I suggest you take one of Dr. Jesus' classes. He might have to work with you a little bit. I'm just not worried about releasing that. Oh, okay. Cool. Free spring. There you go. I have uh, too slow with the internet to bother. Oh. Oh. Um, way too slow. But our determinants change. And as they change, it changes the way we think about the product, and that will cause a shift in demand. Our demand curve will actually look different than it did before when something changes. Okay. 
shift in demand is a change. Of, it, no matter what the price is, we're going to buy more. We're going to buy less because the way we think about the product, the way we feel about the product, the amount of money we have, something fundamentally has changed. This is Harry's demand for milk. Carrie has a doctor's appointment this afternoon. And Carrie's doctor has already told me the results of the test that they, blood test that they did last week. And Carrie is allergic to milk. And it is a serious milk allergy. And the doctor's pretty much thinking that if he keeps drinking milk, he's going to die. Does that change the way Carrie thinks about milk? Yes. Oh, yes. So is Carrie going to say, oh, well, that's fine. Let's see. Milk's still selling for $3 a gallon. I'm just going to keep drinking a couple gallons. Uh, no. What's going to happen? If milk is selling for $5, $5 a piece, how much milk is he drinking? None. If milk is selling for $4 a gallon, what's he drinking? None. If $3 a gallon, he's drinking? None. $2 a gallon, he's drinking? None. $1 drinking? None. $1 a gallon, he's drinking? None. If he can get it for 50 cents, okay, he'll drink a little bit. He's saying. So his demand now looks like that because he prefers not to drink something that will kill him. All right, that number one thing on that list of determinants, change. He would prefer not to drink something that will kill him, changes the way he thinks or feels about the milk. No matter what the price is, he's going to drink less than he would have before. You're listening to less Britney Spears and Miley Cyrus what, R. Kelly now, he's kind of, and, um, um, dude, and what's the other one? There, there's some musicians that we're listening to less of than we did before. There are other musicians that you are now listening to more of than you did before. Demand for these things dangerous. So, but what if alternate universe, shake the edge of Word comes out tomorrow that, okay, not only will milk, drinking milk give you strong bones and healthy teeth, that's what they tell you, now, right? But a new study comes out, it's going to be in the paper all over the internet tomorrow saying that if you drink milk, it's going to make you smarter, faster, stronger, and more attractive. Does that change what you think and feel about milk? Sure. Yeah, so what are we going to do? Carrie's going to say, well, uh, yeah, milk's still three dollars a gallon, but I'm gonna be drinking more than two gallons. All right. In that case, you would end up with an increased milk at three dollars a gallon. Instead of drinking two gallons, he is now gonna drink four gallons a week. If the price of milk was went up to uh, five dollars a gallon, he used to only buy one gallon, but now he's gonna end up buying like three. So he ends up with a whole new demand curve. Because he preferred to drink something that will make her stronger, make him stronger, faster, smarter, whatever, all of that, all those things, right? So, our demand changes. Yep. Yeah. If whatever happens is good news, you're going to get an increase in demand. Milk makes it stronger. Is that good? Makes it stronger, faster, better looking. That's good. Uh, in I don't know, it just doesn't get any better. It is bad news, like milk will kill you, it's gonna shift the back of the left. Or milk is gonna kill you, or drinking milk is now seen to be uncool because all the people are like, oh, it's hard on the cows, you're sitting there being whatever. Just, so people are like gonna get mad at people for worrying for drinking milk and that kind of stuff, so you only have to drink milk in privacy in your own home, hopefully, that nobody notices and you smuggle it out of the not just a grocery store in brown paper bags, hopefully, hopefully nobody will notice. It'll slow you down a little bit. All right. So good news, the demand will increase. Demand, bad news, demand will decrease. Getting a pay raise. Is that good? Yeah. Yeah. So what's going to end up happening? You got more money. What are you spending your money on now? You ain't got much money, so what are you spending it on? The bare minimum. The bare minimum of necessities and anything left over? Saving. saving. The things you really, really like. The things you really, really like, things you really, really need. So, guess what? If those things are the most important things that you have a limited amount of money, that's what you're spending it on, or what happens if you get more money, you kind of stands for reason you'll be buying more of those same things. 
Even though y'all are flat, broke, busted, you still manage to find a way to eat a couple packs of peanut M&Ms a week. Well, if you get more money, given how important peanut M&Ms seem to be to you, do you get pay raise? You're probably going to end up buying three or four packs of this peanut M&Ms a week. You can start buying about a big pound, pound and a half bags. That's a pack a day to keep the doctor away. Yeah. I've kind of said this, so don't get lost in the weeds here. A change, I'm starting at the bottom. A change in demand, a change in your willingness and ability. Changing the way you think about the product is going to cause you to get a whole new demand curve. It's going to be shifting to another place. Where a change in demand is where you're just moving to a different spot on the same demand, the way that you feel about the product didn't change. But yet you're buying a different amount. And why would that be? That's what happens when the price changes. The price changes you moving to a different spot on the same demand curve. If anything other than the price change, you get to a whole new demand curve. Why? Because what is that? Gra what is the graph when we're graphing the demand curve? We're graphing it against price. So that demand curve is showing what you would do when price changes. So naturally, when price changes, you're going to be on a different spot on that curve. It's like somebody gives you a map of the highway, and you're driving down the highway, you're going to be on a different spot on that map, right? You get on a different road, different situation, All right? I've never done that metaphor before. I guess that works. So, when price changes, it changes how much you buy. It doesn't necessarily impact how you feel about the product. How you should feel about the product is also going to impact how much you buy. Or it can also do it. Market demand curve, because that's when we take, what was it? Uh, peanut butter, we talked about earlier. Carrie's demand for peanut butter, Josie's demand for peanut butter, Lovely's demand for peanut butter. We took everybody's demand for peanut butter, we put it together, and that will be the market demand for peanut butter. And it's just based up, made up of all the individual demands. But that curve ultimately ends up being downwardly sloping. We're not buying the same amount of M&Ms at a price of $5 that we would buy at a price of $1. Why? Because we sort of make the decision, I get a dollar's worth of enjoyment out of it, I don't get $5 worth of enjoyment out of it. Because it generally tends to be this thing about the more you eat, the less joy, the less usefulness you're going to get out of each extra one that you eat. Going back to utility, utility, usefulness, and satisfaction. We have a whole chapter to join. Uh, congratulations, you already have a car, all right? Congratulations, your uncle says, I'm going to give you a brand new car. Only thing, you can't sell it. How profound of a change on your life is that? Huge. So you got a whole new car, and how often do you need to be driving it? Yeah. So then tomorrow your uncle comes up to you and says, congratulations, I'm giving you another new car. You can't sell it either. How big of a thing is that one? It's pretty big. Yeah. It's pretty big, but it ain't that profound, right? Because now you've got this vehicle, well now i got one vehicle I'm going to be driving, and okay, now i got two vehicles I'm going to be driving each week. So this the first vehicle, if I only was given one vehicle, I'm driving seven days a week. Now, now I'm, I'm going to have one of them I'm going to be driving three and a half days a week, the other one I'm going to be driving three and a half days a week. If your uncle comes along and says, congratulations, free car number three, four, five, six, seven. You can't sell them. So now, that seventh car, what is it doing to you? It's just the vehicle you can be driving one day a week. How much are you willing to pay for a car that you would drive seven days a week? I still take the six or seven cars and go to the bank and borrow some money and buy a house because now I have assets that can stand for a loan. Boom. Very, very weekly. Because very they, weekly, but still, yeah. I mean, come on, you're starting with nothing and somebody gives you six free cars? Yes. Oh, I mean, I mean that is an interesting strategy here. I will give you again. Um, but I'm trying to keep this out of the weeds so much. But uh, 
But a vehicle that we're going to use seven days a week, a lot of us are willing to pay two, three hundred dollars a month for it. How many of you got a car bank? One of you. Okay. But a vehicle that you're only going to use one day a week, how much are you willing to pay for that? At least property taxes. Yeah. Not a whole lot. Uh, I actually had an opportunity to buy a truck the other day, and I'm like, hmm, I thought about it, but then I'm like, Ugh, and I actually let it go by because I'm like, it, it didn't have an extended cab in it. It was just a regular cab, and it was one of the smaller Dakotas, so I we could fit the whole family in there. So I'm like, well, we're going to Christmas tree shop, and I guess so pretty much all I need to use them is hauling hay and junk and just beating it around the farm. And I'm like, yeah. no. Because I would, the, the vehicle would only get driven like once or once a week, twice a week. I'm like, I, it, it won't give me enough gas miles for me to be driving here back. On a hot summer day, you've been out mowing the lawn for a couple, two, three hours, or whatever you've been doing for a couple, two, three hours. You're hot. You grab that first, whatever that first drink of choice is, how fantastic is it? It's oh, so good. It's fantastic. How much would you be willing to drink, pay for something that's going to make you, oh, 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 that's fantastic. A lot. Okay, and after you drink that first one, you get the second one. It's going to be pretty good. Not as good as the first one, but still gonna taste pretty good. How about the third one? Or the fourth one? How about that eighth one, the one that's gonna make you start throwing up? How much are you willing to pay for something that's gonna make you throw up? Have any of you bought that do this all? Otherwise, yeah, we ain't gonna pay. So the more you end up consuming something, the less enjoyment you can get out of it, the less satisfaction you can get out of it, so the less you're willing to pay for it. An ideal world would be if you could just sort of pay off the deal. This is how much joint I'm going to get out of the first pack of m and You pay the high price, and I'm not going to get as much out of the second pack of m and I'll sell you the second pack a little bit cheaper. I'm not going to get a whole lot of joy out of the third one, and you still have to eat cheaper. It, it doesn't work that way. So somewhere along the line, we get to the point where we stop. Because our enjoyment, the usefulness, it goes down. Some of you, peanut M&M's is your favorite snack in the whole wide world, and at least sometime this semester, you're going to go to that snack machine down the hallway, and you're going to buy something other than peanut M&M's, even though you said they're your favorite. Well, if you already had three packs today, you've already had three packs of peanut M&M's, maybe you're going to want something different. Maybe the first Snickers is going to give you more enjoyment than pack number four of peanut M&M's. So that's the law of diminishing. Diminishing means the shrink. Did we talk about that first week of two days ago, four days ago? No? I'm having a flashback. Okay. Diminishing means to shrink. Get smaller. Marginal means extra. Utility is usefulness, enjoyment, satisfaction. So that's how you hopefully you can break that one down. Shrinking, extra, enjoyment. Each extra car that you get is going to bring less usefulness for you. Each extra employee that you hire is going to bring you. Less work getting done. Each extra pack of M&Ms you eat is going to give you less enjoyment. Eating the same amount of calories, but less enjoyment. All right. Somewhere along the line, when you're at the Pizza Hut buffet, you eat 15 slices of pizza. That 16th one is going to do so little for you. You don't eat. You're not even work. You're not even willing to walk across the restaurant to get it. That's kind of the demand piece. Now we're going to sort of roll in supply. Supply looks at our willingness and ability to produce a product. I already talked about that. But the market supply, that's all of our willingnesses and abilities put together to produce. And the law of supply is the higher the price, the more they're willing to make. None of you are willing to go into the watermelon business if watermelons were selling for a buck a piece. If you could sell them for $100 a piece, a bunch of you were interested. At $100 a piece, some of y'all were sitting there figuring out, I'm not only going to be planting them in my backyard, I'm going to be going dirt on the garage roof, throwing some seeds up there and seeing more luck. Y'all start getting creative. More is going to get grown as price gets higher. More is going to get reduced as price gets higher. The price gets lower, it's going to be harder for you to make profit. It's going to slow things down. So just like you did a demand schedule for here, you can do a supply schedule, which is like how much would people produce if the price was a dollar, how much would they produce if the price was a dollar, 
approved for and by and generally using when price goes up, orders can be made. I don't know. Um, so that's why I was just trying to figure out. It's got to be bigger than a cookie, but not a whole lot bigger than a cookie, but not a cake. Cupcake. How many of you can afford to make and sell cupcakes at the dollar a piece? That's kind of tough. That's going to be kind of tight. How many of you two dollars a piece? Maybe maybe some of you that some of y'all that already know how to cook and already have an oven and that kind of stuff, y'all can maybe start doing it. Maybe you're not gonna go all in with it to try to make a living off of it, but a little part time or three dollars a piece. Some of y'all that don't have ovens can now afford to buy ovens, maybe you yourself can start for three dollars a piece because you can cook what 12, 15 of them at the time. I don't know. Five dollars a piece? Maybe. You can afford to be Having ovens and hiring people to be sticking the stuff in the ovens for you, right? So, or it's going to be late. So, yeah, we'll go with okay. And the market supply is just taking the supply of each individual. How many cupcakes is Carrie willing and able to make at the different prices? How many cupcakes is Josie willing and able to make? How many cupcakes is Lovely and willing and able to make? How many cupcakes is David willing and able to make? I sort of, I've got to. I'm trying to make sure I got everybody's names. I'm really making sure I get the new people in the bill. If I keep saying those names, I'll get there. So we can graph that supply schedule, and you get a supply curve that looks like this. When price gets higher, price is going up. What's happening? More is getting made. Not very shocking. But this curve, if you look, notice how it's turning up over here? It's getting steeper. Why? Because there's a finite amount that you produce so much of before you there's the drop price down. Well, it's not because of price. Because the max will be the charge. So you would say my person. No. Well, no, it's not about charging because that's getting into demand. That we don't we're not looking at here. But what ends up happening is this is based on where you are now, based on the ovens you have now, the refrigerators you have now, the kitchen you have now. And you get to the point where down here you got an oven and it's only running a couple hours a day. So how easy is it for you to get that oven running eight hours a day? Twelve hours a day? That's fairly easy, but then you start getting to the point where you know if this curve just could get steeper and steeper and steeper, that's like it doesn't matter if the price is getting higher, I've got that oven running wide, stinking open. All right. As soon as that door is open, so one hand is grabbing one tray of cupcakes, another hand is shoving the next one in, and that door is only open for 12 seconds. All right. Because what you've done all that you can do. In reality, what the supply curve is really going to look like, it's going to look like this. This is the range you're working at with one oven, but the price gets high enough, you do what? We can afford to buy a second oven, and now you're in a new reality. We got a second oven, we can make more, make more cupcakes, make more cupcakes, the price goes up, and we max out that second oven. And then what happens? We go to the store, we buy the third oven, and there you go. And so this is really in a series of jumps. So and so generally, the supply curve you're going to look, like, look at is, oh, let me get rid of all the one here. So this is pretty much just looking at one chunk of that. Yeah, so this is generally the supply curve is looking at the chunk of reality as it is right now, based on the oven you have right now as an individual. The oven you have, the refrigerator you have, the number of acres of the farm you have, the tractor you have, the truck you have, this is all you can do. And how can you get the most bang for your buck out of the oven, refrigerator, tractor, truck, rifle that you have? Take salt. Yeah, I don't know if right this is these kind of okay. So this is where you are now as a business. When we talk about the market supply curve, that would be generally based on the number, total number of ovens being used by the total number of bakeries. Total, what are their situations looking like? You end up with something that steps up like this. And theoretically, yeah, this sucker, it's going to, it's not going to drop, grind all the way down to zero, zero. 
you know, it's not going to come here because yep, you got to have a couple of eggs in there and some flour and some sugar, right? And vanilla extract. I don't know what all you need in a cupcake, right? But just sheer ingredients alone. If you were just to take how much would it cost you for an egg, a thing of sugar, and a thing of flour, and a couple of drops of vanilla extract, and you to try to bake it on a rocky backyard? You know, it's still going to cost you 15 cents or whatever for those ingredients, all right? It ain't never going to get down to zero. Unless you've got, you can magically, I don't know, your Harry Potter, you can say egg, boom, and then have an egg appear, or right? You can do that too. <laughs> yes. Yes, but then why? Well, but then you had the cost of magic wand on the road. So, and for the record, I think that's probably the first Harry Potter reference that I've ever made in class, ever. So, landmark. Yes, this is a landmark moment in history here for you. Um, okay, Harry Potter trademark, J.K. Rowling, Paul Rachel, sir. Uh, so, what determines our willingness and ability to produce? What makes somebody say, "Well, yeah, I'm going to grow. I'm going to go in business making cupcakes and trying to sell them. I'm going to go in business trying to grow soybeans. Why well, I'm going to make grow my own tomatoes in the backyard and for my own consumption instead of buying them from the store." Not necessarily. The price of your ingredients, I kind of hinted at it. The price of the egg, sugar, flour, vanilla extract, tomato seeds, soybean seeds, fertilizer, gasoline, electricity. What are the cost of ingredients? And that's really the first and foremost. If you cannot sell a cupcake for more than the price of the ingredients to go into the cupcake, it ain't happening. Because every cupcake you make is getting you further and further in debt. It cost me 50 cents worth of ingredients for a cupcake I can sell for a dollar. I mean, a cupcake I can only sell for a quarter. I'm losing 25 extra cents for every extra cupcake that I'm doing. What am I I'm stopping now? Right. So it starts with the price of ingredients. Then there's what else you need besides ingredients? No. Land, labor, capital, and knowledge needed. Did we talk about that list? Yeah. yeah. We've had it in 201. You need, this is called the factor cost of factors of production. You need a place for the work to get done. Where is these companies going to get made? Land and buildings, so they roll together. I keep being land sure. But where is the work going to get done? Who's going to do the work? If you're a small business, that's you. If you're going to be bigger business, you're going to have other people that are begging for you. Maybe if, when you're starting out your own cupcake business, you are all of this. Right? It's your kitchen is the land. Your labor is you. Knowledge is whatever's in your brain or whatever you can find on the internet. Right? And in capital, a lot of people call capital money. Well, capital is not money. Capital is tools and equipment. Now you see why I type everything up. Right? Capital is tools and equipment. We measure it in terms of money. We say you've got five thousand dollars worth of equipment. We're not just sitting saying, "Well, you got three ovens, two refrigerators, a mixer, a spatula, a pan." A... Right? We say you got five thousand dollars worth of equipment, and so we have the cost of your capital five thousand dollars worth of equipment. That's what we talk about. Your accountants talk about your capital, they, they, they give you money, but that money is representing the tools and equipment. So you got the equipment you're using, the place that it's getting done, who's doing it, and the knowledge. How many of you know how to make a cupcake? Okay, so half of you cannot start a cupcake business yet, right? But luckily, how easy is it to find out how to make a cupcake? Pretty easy. Relatively easily. May not be a good cupcake, but you can find out how to make one pretty quick. How many of you have a nuclear reactor? You have access to uranium. Only if only. Okay, so you have land and you have labor, but you don't know how to build a nuclear weapon and you don't have the centrifuges and stuff you need in order to purify your uranium or plutonium in order to make a bomb. 
I might be close to the knowledge not to be, I'm not anywhere near close to making a degree weapon. So it's ultimately the, it ain't that complex. If you just get enough of it in a small enough tight enough area where it will reach critical mass. I can actually draw the designs for how like the, the A bomb that took out Hiroshima. Yeah, I can actually draw that one for you. I like that. Technology. Oops. Oh. Yeah. Fast enough. Technology. What technology is there out there that will enable you to do things? And maybe what technology is out there that will, how is technology changing to let you better able to, to do things? Okay, the silly example that I used last semester that we talked about making watermelons. I always had somebody that was like allergic to dirt or whatever. I said, we're going to tell them to wipe them to death. They can, everything they touch dies. That person came for watermelons, right? But go to Star Trek and say, you know, they came up with that, the, 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 the replicator thing, did, you know, they come up to the machine, computer, watermelon, this is a watermelon appears out of nowhere. That would enable somebody to get a watermelon business even if they're allergic to watermelons, right? And then I went through the thing, like you tip the thing over and then you have it on a ramp rolling, right? So the watermelons appear roll right down a ramp and then like a truck and you never have to touch it. And then you have tape recorder that's recording, it's playing a loop of your voice saying computer watermelon every three seconds and you don't even have to be there anymore, right? Technology can enable you to make more than you could before, enable you to do faster and more than you could before and even do things that you couldn't do before. We can type a whole lot faster with a computer than we could with a typewriter. And then other goods, here again, you've got to look at, okay, well, what's it going to take for me to bake cupcakes? And what all is involved in making cupcakes? But then you kind of got to have an eye toward what's going on with cookies, what's going on with brownies, what's going on with cakes, that kind of stuff. If price of cakes and price of brownies and all that stuff is dirt cheap, or if it's easier to make a cupcake, I mean a cake than it is to make a cupcake, maybe you can end up doing one or the other. Uh, if you're sitting there trying to decide, am I going to be planting soybeans versus corn, and you look at how much water is out here in the field, and you might decide, well, maybe corn might be better this next year than soybeans. Oh, I didn't tell you all that hard story, but that kid soybeans didn't matter. Is there any help that you can get from the government in starting your business? Or the opposite is how much are you going to have to call up to the government because you're in business. The tax cuts a year or two ago was saying, okay, when you start your business, you get to keep a bigger chunk of your profit. So that makes people say, hey, I can make more profit. So maybe I am willing to start my own business. Where if the tax cuts go away and they do a tax increase to say, well, we're going to take a bigger chunk of your profit. And there's going to be some people that say, well, I'm working for me. I ain't working for Uncle Sam. And if Uncle Sam and Aunt Jean can be taking all of this money, so why should I bother? But then if you're Microsoft and you're the county of Boynton in the state of Virginia, the same, well, we'll like give you cheap electricity and you don't have to pay property taxes and we'll wind the highway for you and all this kind of stuff and give you some money because we know when you come in here and set up this data center, you're going to hire some of our local people. Yeah, that's why Microsoft put a data center in. Boynton, Virginia, when there's nothing else in Boynton, Virginia, including cell phone signal in Boynton, Virginia. As I'm going down the road and I'm like coming, when I hit the straightaway where the far end of the straightaway is driveway to the Microsoft Data Center, that's when I have to tell my wife goodbye. I love you because our call was finally disconnected. Kind of thing that definitely happened there. And here again, expectations. What do you think is going to be happening? If you think, yeah, I can afford to go into, I, I know how to make cupcakes. I have the ovens and refrigerators and stuff to do it. I can do it. I can afford the price of the ingredients. I can get into the cupcake business, but I know my neighbor's going into the cupcake business. The person across the street's going into the cupcake business. And there's three bakeries just down the street already. That's going to kind of change what you're thinking, right? Um, if you think that, News is going to be coming out tomorrow saying the cupcakes are actually pills of death, fluffy pills of death. Are you going to want to start producing cupcakes? If you think Apple, Samsung and Apple are going to start getting the cupcake business tomorrow, are you going to want to go ahead and try to compete against them now? 
get the smart cupcake and you say, okay, Google, eat my cupcake next time. But thanks, Ricky. What do you think is going to be happening for you? What do you think is happening in the future as far as the economy? If you're living in downtown Alberta and you think that everybody in the town is going to be packing up and moving away next year, in the next year, are you going to bother to set up a business now? No. If you think that cigarettes are going to get banned as an illegal substance, are you going to start growing tobacco this year? Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, let me back up on that one. Maybe yes. Um. One left. No, I just want my cigarettes, and I'll be damned if I can't go to the store and buy some. So yeah. I just grow up. Um, so, uh, but what do you think is going to happen to the future that is going to be coloring your decisions as well? Here again, price is not there. Price is going to determine since you can do it. How many are you going to do? Since you are willing to do it and you are able to do it, how many cupcakes are you going to cook? And that's to be dictated by the grandma. Because guess what? The price is going to dictate how many people are going to buy, and that's kind of when you will put that piece of the puzzle together next to that. Any questions? No. We have it? Are you hungry? Yes. Okay. So we're going to get some peanut M&M for a cupcake on the drive home. And I will see you Tuesday.